It is my honor and privilege to introduce this year's COES Distinguished Internal Lecture, uh, Lecture, Dr. Janet Badia. Since coming, sorry, um, since coming to this campus in 2009 as the Director of Women's Studies, Dr. Badia has been a transformational figure on this campus. She has achieved amazing things with the Women's Studies program, growing the number of majors and minors, developing connections between the program and the community, revising the curriculum to expand both the intellectual rigor of the program and the applied side of Women's Studies, um, expanding service learning and community outreach. She has been a mentor to students through her work as, a, um, as an academic advisor and as advisor to three student organizations. Most recently, she has developed and led the Gender and Justice Institutes for high school um, students, uh, which also allowed her the opportunity to involve, involve her advanced students in the planning and running of the activities for the institutes, uh, a model in both student engagement and community outreach. But Dr. Badia's impact goes far beyond women's studies. Uh, she has been a mentor. Um, she has been a mentor to faculty on this campus, both formally through being part of the mentoring committees for junior faculty in multiple departments in the College of Arts and Sciences, and by serving on P&T committees, both in COAS and in other colleges for other departments. Uh, but she has also mentored um, uh, faculty in, in, in countless ways outside the formal structures. She has served as a senator when women's studies still had representation in the Senate. Um, she has served on a wide range of committees, including advisory committee on equity and sexual violence Prevention Committee. In 2014, she was elected as the IU faculty speaker, the first woman in that role. Uh, Dr. Badia is, um, is only the third female faculty member who has been chosen to be an internal distinguished lecturer, and she was the one who prepared the nomination materials for the first two women who presented as part of this, um, as part of this series. One of the things that differentiates women's studies from many other disciplines is that women's studies has, a, um, has a, a, a very strong activist component built into the discipline. Janet Badia, through her daily work, embodies feminist principles in action, uh, a model of a feminist life. She doesn't just research women's representation, she advocates and fights for it. Through all of this, she has also been a productive scholar, cementing her reputation as an internationally recognized Sylvia Plath scholar and expanding her research agenda to include representation of women in art, feminist pedagogy, and service learning. She's an author of two books and nine articles, which is a lot in, the human <laughs> in most humanities disciplines. Um, she has presented her work at numerous local, national, and international conferences, including serving as the invited keynote speaker. One of the great things about Dr. Badia's work, uh, work is that while it has gained recognition in academic circles, she has also been able to make her research accessible to a broader audience, with her work cited in popular magazines and newspapers as well. The honor of being selected a distinguished internal lecturer for COAS is a fitting acknowledgement of Dr. Badia's scholarly accomplishments up till now and a powerful a public statement on the value that the, Co the College of Arts and Sciences places on scholarship by women academics and on topics that deal with women's voices. The audience here today, uh, faculty, um, both faculty and students, um, is a testament to the relevance of her research as she bridges her scholarly work on writing about women and women readers with the contemporary movement um, uh, of Me Too. And so it is my pleasure to present her with a plaque, which I left on the chair. <laughs> I'm so sorry. Um, I'm sorry, Josh. I know uh, you, you trusted me to do one thing, and um, I almost failed. So uh, Dr. Badia, would you please come up? <laughs> so it is my pleasure to present you with this plaque. Um, and we all look forward to a wonderful um, Probably slightly depressing, uh, but all, but nonetheless wonderful, um, wonderful presentation. Um, I just really would like to thank Anne for that um, introduction, which um, I would like to be the person Anne thinks I am, <laughs> um, and I'm gonna have to switch classes too. So I'd also like to thank the College of Arts and Sciences for giving me uh, the opportunity to talk about um, this topic tonight, and particularly the Faculty Affairs Committee um, for selecting me for um, the honor and opportunity. Um, I want to give just a couple prefatory notes. So um, 
there is some pretty heavy content in my talk. Um, there are some um, F-bombs and other things um, because I'm quoting um, some pretty important texts. So just to prepare everybody um, and welcome to Women's Studies. <laughs> if periods of history were delineated by social movements instead of wars, October 2017 would mark the pivotal moment of a new epoch. On October 5th, we saw the publication of a New York Times investigation revealing 30 years worth of allegations of sexual misconduct against film executive and Hollywood powerhouse Harvey Weinstein. The New York Times piece was followed five days later by a more in-depth piece in The New Yorker that reflected the results of Ronan Farrell's 10-month investigation into accusations made against Weinstein by more than a dozen women. In the wake of these stories, on October 15th, actress Alyssa Milano, sorry. well, I swear it was working earlier. There you go. Uh, actress Alyssa Milano tweeted out, if you've been sexually harassed or assaulted, write me too as a reply to this tweet. And people around the world obliged her sending more than 10,000 reply tweets in just 20 minutes. According to data published by the Pew Research Center, the hashtag MeToo generated more than 19 million tweets in its first year of viral existence, 29% of which were written in languages other than English, suggesting a truly broad, transnational movement of awareness and solidarity. As the hashtag gained momentum, a parallel Twitter campaign began this one, spearheaded by women of color, determined to make sure the originator of the Me Too concept received her due recognition. As many people would soon learn from the unfolding campaign, one amplified when Alyssa Milano herself picked up the cause to give proper attribution, the Me Too movement was not new. It originates in 2006 when Tarana Burke, founder and director of the Just Be Inc excuse me, <laughs> founder and director of the Just Be Inc. youth organization, developed the Me Too campaign on MySpace, remember that? Um, to help sexual assault survivors and underserved communities find resources and heal from their traumas. On the website of Just Be Inc., Burke locates the roots of the campaign and one particular moment she experienced leading an all-girl bonding session at a youth camp. The day following the session, one of the girls, Heaven, who had clung to Burke throughout the camp and who had about her a, quote, deep sadness and a yearning for confession, asked to speak directly to Burke privately. Burke's description of her reaction to Heaven's, rev to Heaven's revelation of sexual abuse is as honest as it is surprising. She says, I was horrified by her words. The emotions welling inside of me ran the gamut, and I listened until I literally could not take it anymore, which turned out to be less than five minutes. Then, right in the middle of her sharing her pain with me, I cut her off and immedi immediately directed her to another female counselor who could help her better. I will never forget the look on her face, the shock of being rejected, the pain of opening a wound only to have it abruptly forced close again. I could not find the courage that she had found. I could not muster the energy to tell her that I understood, that I connected, that I could feel her pain. I could not find the strength to say out loud the words that were ringing in my head over and over again as she tried to tell me what she had endured. I watched her walk away from me as she tried to recapture her secrets and tuck them back into their hiding place. I watched her put her mask back on and go into the world like she was all alone and I couldn't even bring myself to whisper, me too. I quote this context at length here, first to underscore Burke's voice and place in the Me Too movement, and second to tease out the complexities of this particular origin story. Burke's retelling of this crucial moment in the formation of the movement is, importantly, about both the invitation to witness and the inability to listen. It's about the sharing of pain and the retreat from what that sharing requires of its listeners. 
It's about the discovery of one's voice and about the repression of connection, of empathy, and of solidarity with that voice. In many ways, it's an unexpected origin story for a movement that is, above all, about connection and identification. Me, too. <clears throat> In fall 2018, I had the opportunity to hear Tarana Burke speak at Purdue West Lafayette. Structured as a dialogue between Burke and an interviewer, the conversation on this occasion revealed yet another facet of the movement's origin story. One defined not by Burke's inability to whisper the words, me too, but by a suddenly materialized consciousness that Burke arrives at through her early experiences as a young reader. On the stage that day, Burke explained that her own Me Too moment of a connection came when, as a young girl, she read the novel The Bluest Eye by Toni Morrison and the memoir I Know Why the Caged Bird Sings by Maya Angelou, two literary texts that place stories of childhood sexual abuse at their center and that revolutionized literary culture when they were first published. As a scholar whose work has largely focused on women readers and the stories that are central to their reading experiences, I couldn't have scripted a better origin story myself. It highlights not only the power of literature, as the two discussed that night on stage, but also the question of whose literature matters and deserves to be read. Even as the moment reinforced many of my own values and assumptions about literature, it also challenged my, my thinking in ways I have to confess I am still processing. Hearing Tarana Burke describe her own reading, reading of Morrison and Angelo as a girl had led me to revisit, as, as she was a girl, when she was a girl, has led me to revisit my own thinking about sexual assault and abuse and the ways it has been, excuse me, has led me to revisit my own thinking about the ways women's writing in general, but especially women's writing about sexual assault and abuse, has been understood or misunderstood. And I know I'm not the only one grappling with such matters. The hashtag MeToo has disrupted more than just men's privilege. It's disrupted syllabi, class discussions, and approaches to a broad range of texts and subject matters. Which is not to say that these later ma latter matters aren't connected to male privilege. That the biggest social movement of the past year and a half has its roots in women's literature, particularly literature written by women of color, can teach us a lot about the relationships between systems of privilege and power in our institutions. In an effort to uncover the complexities of these relationships, I set out tonight to map out the constellation of questions and issues that 18 months of thinking and reading about the Me Too movement within the context of a career that has been focused on women's stories and their audiences has led me to. This map is an unusually complex one, and I warn you that my presentation tonight is going to look more like string art than a linear argument. Part one, you didn't hear a thing. Given their place in Tarana Burke's story, I want to spend the next two sections of my talk examining I Know Why the Caged Bird Sings, which I will simply refer to as Caged Bird, and the bluest eye in a bit more detail. It's perfectly fitting, of course, that Burke would single out these two particular texts. Published just months apart in late 1969 and early 1970, each centers on the lives of black girls coming of age in the middle decades of the 20th century. Both would eventually establish their authors as major new voices in a literary landscape undergoing significant upheavals, and both occupy similar spaces at the poles of a love-hate spectrum. In A New Literary History of America, Cheryl Wall provides important context to thinking about the significance of these two publications within what Hortense Spillers has called the community of black women's writing that was redefining American literature in the, in the early 1970s, not only through the production of new text by new writers, but also through the recovery of forgotten or subjugated texts from prior literary periods that were brought back into print 
texts by Nella Larson and Zora Neale Hurston among them. For Wall, the 1950s and 1960s were defined by the works of Richard Wright, James Baldwin, and Amari Baraka, who produced a body of literature in which, quote, female characters watch the action from the sidelines. Good women offer succor and encouragement, while bad ones got in the way. In the 1970s, black women changed the script. Their plots, characters, and prose introduced something new to American literature. Their protagonists were often females who faced choices every bit as challenging as their male precursors, though their dilemmas were often more private than public. Bucking the tradition of autobiography as a genre about the lives of great men, Caged Bird is certainly an example of one such game changer. The autobiography tells Angelo's story from ages three to six, opening with her early memories as a child living with her paternal grandmother in Stamps, Arkansas, following her time spent in St. Louis when she is sent to live with her mother's family, and ending with the birth of her son when Maya, now relocated to California, is just 16. While the autobi autobiography has been largely hailed as a work about personal perseverance, it's perhaps best known for the handful of pages that retell the trauma of eight-year-old Maya's sexual abuse and eventual rape by her mother's boyfriend, Mr. Freeman. It's an act of violence the young Maya is not equipped to even understand, but that propels her life forward nonetheless. As if the trauma of the rape weren't brutalizing enough, Maya is also coerced into silence as Mr. Freeman threatens to kill her beloved brother Bailey should Maya ever whisper a word to anyone about the abuse. While Maya fully intends to heed Mr. Freeman's injunction that she not tell anyone, she falls terribly ill following the physical and emotional trauma to her body. And while changing her soiled sheets, her brother Bailey discovers the bloodied underwear she had hid beneath her mattress after the final assault. When forced to face Mr. Freeman in the courtroom where he is being tried for the rape, Maya is asked by his lawyer if Mr. Freeman had ever attempted to touch her before the alleged rape took place. Unable to understand, let alone express the complexity of her response to the initial molestations, which Maya misreads as a sign of love and caring, and to give everyone in the courtroom the answer they appeared to need, Maya lies and says no and the lump, quote, lied in her throat. When the trial ends, Mr. Freeman is given one year and one day for the crime, but for reasons never made explicit in the text, he is released that very afternoon. Shortly thereafter, Maya comes to learn that Mr. Freeman is found murdered, likely the victim of a beating delivered by her uncles. His murder unleashes a wave of guilt on Maya's part as she confuses cause and effect. Quote, a man was dead because I lied, she concludes. Her grandmother issues her own injunction when she realizes that the children had overheard the news of Mr. Freeman's death, telling them, quote, you didn't hear a thing. I never want to hear the situation nor that evil man's name mentioned in my house again. It's an injunction that only reinforces Maya's misperception that, quote, evilness was flowing through my body and waiting, pent up, to rush off my tongue if I tried to open my mouth. Convinced she had to stop talking or more people would die, Maya mutes herself to everyone but her brother Bailey. When her muteness is mistaken for impudence, she is sent once again to live with her father's mother in Stamps, Arkansas, where no one appears to acknowledge or even give a hint that they know of the assault and violence that took place in St. Louis and where her silence is understood simply as a sign of how, quote, tender-hearted she is. As if to underscore Maya's isolation, Angelo emphasizes that the child doesn't even know if anyone in her household besides Bailey knows of her trauma. As Cheryl Wall points out, quote, relatively few autobiographies by black women had been published before Angelo wrote hers. None had delved as deeply into the writer's intimate life. In the process, the book helped break a long-standing silence around the issue of sexual violence. 
At times, Cagebird reads as if its author is fully aware of the mutinous nature of the narrative she unfolds, not only in terms of its treatment of taboo topics, but in its demonstration of the power of all kinds of literature in shaping consciousness. Indeed, it is the literature of the white canon, loaned to her by Mrs. Flowers, an acquaintance of her grandmother who invites Maya to her house and who encourages her to memorize and recite poems, that leads young Maya out of her silence and back to her voice. Although her time with Mrs. Flowers isn't Maya's first important experience with books, it remains a defining one, and it initiates what scholars of trauma have written about uh, in relationship to Cage Bird which is the ways in which the books are central to Maya's psychic reintegration. Reading and the connections Maya forms with Mrs. Flowers through her literature are central not only to the restoration of her voice and story, but to her recovery and her empowerment as well. <clears throat> Welcome to Women's Studies. Part two is Little Girl Porn. In a death notice appearing in The Guardian on the occasion of Maya Angelou's death in 2014, Martin Kitsch notes that Cage Bird made Angelou one of the most admired and most banned authors in, the US, in US literary history. While it can be difficult to, me to measure admiration, data collected about censored books makes it easier to judge Kitsch's, latter, Kitsch's claim. Reports collected by the American Library Association beginning in 1990 suggest uh, that Martin Kitsch isn't far from the mark. Between 1990 and 1999, Caged Bird was the third most frequently challenged book on their list. And between 2000 and 2009, it was the sixth most challenged book. A broader examination of available data collected for 2006 ranked Caged Bird as the third most frequently challenged book of the previous 25 years. Parents, school boards, politicians, and organizations with names like Parents Against Bad Books have all attempted to ban Angelo's autobiography. In a 2004 example, Parents in Niles, Indiana, objected to the, quote, graphic depiction of Angelo's molestation as a child and other topics such as lesbianism and the sexual activity of youth. And so goes the pattern of the challenges, whether they took place in Wisconsin or California or Alabama, where the school superintendent purportedly called the book Little Girl Porn after concluding that Angelo's descriptions of being raped as a little girl were pornographic. Interestingly, 2007 marked the last year Caged Bird would crack the top 10 list of the most challenged books. The general consensus among those tracking the data is that its move down the list reflects the larger pattern of how literary books gain acceptance into the canon and how, long, how longevity often becomes a cushion against, against what is considered controversial. But that conclusion, I would suggest, seems less sound when you realize that over the past 10 years, Toni Morrison's The Bluest Eye seems to have replaced Caged Bird as the object of challenges. While 2007 marked the last year Caged Bird would crack the top 10 list of most challenged books, 2006 saw The Bluest Eye emerge as the new Caged Bird. Indeed, since 2013, Morrison's novel has been the second most challenged book after Sherman Alexie's The Absolutely True Diary of a Part-Time Indian. If we remember that the challenges tend to come from parents and conservative groups objecting to books included in school curriculum, we might reasonably conclude that the bluest eye replaced caged bird on the list because it also replaced it within the curriculum. And here I cannot help but mention an irony that a school member pointed out in his own, uh, that a school board member pointed out in his own response to complaining parents in one particular case. At that school, Caged Bird had just recently been added to the 10th grade English curriculum to address previous year complaints that the curriculum lacked books by women and minority writers. There's a little room for diverse writers, provided the content conforms to a single standard. 
In any case, it's interesting that the bluest eye has become central to debates about what stories are appropriate for teenagers, and not only because, as Tarana Burke shows, it is a novel that makes a lasting impact on the young people who read it, <clears throat> um, who read it for the way it, like Cage Bird, unfolds the tragedy of a young girl's rape. It's interesting also because the blue eye places the very idea of the conventional stories children are told at the center of the novel. Built into the novel's very framework is Morrison's commentary on the harm white culture and white media does to black girls as they come of age. For example, the novel threads throughout it a retelling of the classic C. Dick and Jane Runs stories from the popular basal readers that were used to teach children to read throughout the middle decades of the 20th century. While the book's title, The Bluest Eye, evokes the white standards of beauty from Shirley Temple films to blonde, blue-eyed baby dolls that surround the three girls at the heart of the novel and that breeds an internalized and intergenerational racial self-loathing that in turn leads a drunk Charlie Breedlove to rape his 11-year-old daughter, Piccola. Aware of the taboo this story breaks, Aware of the taboo this story breaks, Morrison opens the novel with the phrase, quiet as it's kept. As Morrison explains in the afterword to the 1993 edition of the novel, the phrase had several attractions to her. The words are conspiratorial, shh, don't tell anyone, and no one is allowed to know this. It is a secret between us and a secret that is being kept from us. The conspiracy is both held and withheld, exposed and sustained. Thus, the opening, quiet as it's kept, pro provides the stroke that announces something more than a secret shared, but a silence broken, a void filled, an unspeakable thing spoken at last. In my early research on the reception of Sylvia Plath's novel, The Bell Jar, I was always struck by how many reviewers of the novel found its protagonist, Esther Greenwood, unconvincing as a character and a narrator. Set in the summer of 1953, the novel chronicles Esther's experiences both as a star college student who spends a month in New York City as a guest editor of a major woman's magazine and as a patient at a mental hospital following an, uh, an unsuccessful suicide attempt. That a bright young woman who appears to be on top of the world when we meet her at the novel's start could decline so precipitously into depression and suicidal ideation has puzzled quite a few book reviewers over the years, including during its initial publication in 1963 when Plath first published the novel in the UK under the pseudonym Victoria Lucas and continuing through its many republications under Plath's name. More than one literary critic has argued, in fact, that Plath's weakness as a novelist is that she doesn't prepare us well enough in the first half of the novel, which chronicles her time in New York City, for what comes in the second half as thoughts of self-harm and the futility of life transform into the planning and eventual execution of a suicide attempt, followed by her institutionalization, electroshock therapy, and her eventual release from the hospital. In the handful of reviews of the novel that appeared in 1963, we can see the complaints forming. Quote, there seems no reason why the girl narrator should want to eat narcotics in her own coal hole, wrote Anne Duchesne in the review for The Guardian. Coal hole is a reference to the uh, uh, crawl space in the basement where she goes to um, take the sleeping pills that um, she tries to kill herself with. The critic writing for the Times observes how Esther's, quote, condition never seems painfully serious. Critics writing about the 1966 republication of the novel sound a similar note. Robert Tubman finds it, quote, an unconvincing account of the tragedy of a mental breakdown, while M. L. Rosenthal describes it in his review for The Spectator as the, quote, simple surface account of unexpected breakdown. When we turn to later reviews of the novel following its delayed publication in the US in 1971, the reviews get longer, reflecting both the anticipation of the novel in the US and Plath's by then iconic static status as author. 
But still, a common thread that runs through them is a focus on the suddenness of Esther's breakdown and the corollary question of whether her narration is compelling or convincing. Though here, perhaps because the critics have the luxury of feature columns instead of small book notes, the layers of the complaints get a bit more interesting. Guy Davenport, writing for the National Review, opens his review with a broad pronouncement. Women are all thumbs when it comes to the dissonances and harmonies required of a good plot. Before he reaches the conclusion that the novel's, quote, weaknesses are all the sins of the amateur, including the lack of skill to expose exactly what one is talking about. There is little or nothing to explain the nervous breakdown. Even a near decade of the women's liberation movement of the 1970s fails to really redirect the reading practices of book critics. Saul Maloff, writing about the publication of another Plath work, of, of another of Plath's work, takes the opportunity to reflect on the bell jar as well, declaring, declaring in it, Madness and suicide are random events, forms of tantrum, self-indulgent, excessive, so to speak, unearned, causeless, uncaused in the literary sense, unmotivated, motiveless, gratuitous, and judges the novel of, of no, or excuse me, of small or no intrinsic literary interest. While it's obviously important to avoid the mistake of presentism, I would suggest that there's a lot more going on here than simply the gift of hindsight. Plenty of readers, most of them not professional book critics, have found the novel a compelling, indeed deeply enthralling account of a young woman's experiences, as sales of the novel over its 50 plus years of existence plainly attest. So how do we account for the difference? One place to start would be to look more closely at those moments book critics have noticed and found worthy of mention in their reviews of the bell jar. Among those details of Esther's account that book critics have thought to mention in their reviews, Esther's insecurities and fears, the rejection of her application to the writing course she had planned to take upon her return from New York City, the tomain poisoning she and other guest editors experience after eating bad crab meat at a magazine luncheon, the birth she witnesses when her boyfriend and med student buddy take her around the hospital, and always worth mentioning, the amount of caviar Esther ate at a luncheon. It is rare to find a critic, however, who mentions the moment I would settle on as a crucial one in Esther's narrative, namely the night she is sexually assaulted at a party by Marco, the woman hater, on her last night in New York City. I have argued elsewhere that critics' responses to the bell jar neglect the, the, excuse me, the degree to which the novel is in good measure about Esther's search for sexual autonomy and her rebellion against the double standards and sexual scripts of the 1950s that circumscribed the degree to which she, even as a relatively privileged white woman, could control the expression of her own sexuality. Rethinking the bell jar in light of the hashtag MeToo movement has only strengthened my opinion about the importance of this theme. To be fair, perhaps it's easy enough to overlook what the scene of Esther's sexual assault signifies. It occupies barely three whole pages of the novel, and it is told to us with a degree of emotional detachment they may, that may ultimately undermine its role in Esther's declining health. Esther, as both assault victim and narrator who is retelling the story from some place in the future, doesn't really dwell on the incident. She leaves the scene of, this, of the assault using her black stole to cover her bare shoulders and breasts and finds a car leaving the party that can drop her back in Manhattan. And then she barely reflects on it again. It is nonetheless the moment Plath chooses as the prelude to what is an unmistakable turning point in the novel. Esther's decision to go to the rooftop of the Hotel Amazon, home to all of the guest editors, and to feed her precious and painstakingly acquired wardrobe to the wind, all of it, piece by piece, quote, like a loved one's ashes across the city whose buildings were blackened as if for a funeral. But while Esther doesn't speak of the assault, she leaves New York City literally wearing its trace. 
After Marco throws her to the ground and attacks her, Esther hauls off and punches him in the nose, an act that thwarts the attempted rape. Before he leaves her, he spits the words, sluts, all sluts, yes or no, it is all the same. And he wipes the blood from his nose and then with two strokes stains her cheeks with the blood. In the chapter that follows, Esther returns home to the suburbs of Boston, arriving there with two diagonal lines of dried blood marking her cheeks. As she describes them, <clears throat> they seemed touching and rather spectacular, and I thought I would carry them around with me like the relic of a dead lover till they wore off on their own accord. Of course, if I smiled or moved my face much, the blood would flake away in no time. So I kept my face immobile, and when I had to speak, I spoke through my teeth without disturbing my lips. I didn't really see why people should look at me. Plenty of people looked queerer than I did. One could characterize the hashtag MeToo movement that, that has unfolded over the past 18 months in any number of ways. For many, it has, been an, it has been understood as an outsized example of 21st century call-out culture. For others, it has been an example of our current preoccupation with trauma and trigger warnings. And for others still, including those both sympathetic and unsympathetic to its cause, it has been an excess, it, it has been an example of excess. It's gone too far, it's shared too much, it's been too unforgiving. As a scholar, I find all of these character characterizations interesting, but I've personally found myself gravitating to what the Me Too movement can teach us about how the stories we tell are connected to systems of power. The Australian comedian Hannah Gadsby gives us one of the most interesting and deliberate articulations of these connections in, of all genre, a stand-up comedy routine she debuted in 2017 and that came to the US in 2018 in the form of a Netflix special. Entitled Nanette, the 69-minute set, hailed as a masterpiece of anti-comedy, covers everything from Gadsby's frustrations with audience feedback over the insufficient level of, quote, lesbian content in her routines, to the awkwardness of being misgendered, to her experiences as a lesbian growing up in the Bible Belt of Tasmania, where homosexuality was criminal until 1997, so through her formative years. But it's the way Gadsby reassesses and, re and revises the self-deprecating stories she has told in her own past comedy routines that led me to want to talk about Nanette today. As she explains at one point, you learn from the part of the story you focus on. I need to tell my story properly. Indeed, what we learn at the end of the routine is that a particular story that Gadsby tells in the first half of the routine, one in which she is mistaken as a man by the boyfriend of a woman she has been flirting with and threatened with violence until the boyfriend realizes she's not a bloke and therefore not a bother, is that the original version of the story told to great laughs did not in fact end with the genial resolution she had earlier described. And I'm sorry, spoiler alerts, um, yeah. She did in fact, quote, get the shit beat out of her. A reality she never reports to the police or seeks treatment for because as she explains, her internalized shame won't allow either. But before Gadsby gets to this revelation and several other gut-wrenching revelations of abuse, she first unfolds in a rather circuitous but no less brilliant fashion a, me a meditation on art history that mocks the notion of the male misunderstood genius and excoriates the misogyny underlying depictions of women's bodies and identities throughout art, art history, depictions that reduce women to either virgins or whores. It's a line of thinking that brings her eventually to Pablo Picasso, an artist celebrated for the ways he revolutionized our understanding of perspective in painting, despite glaring evidence of a misogyny that appears to be foundational to his very identity. 
For Gadsby, this misogyny is most evident in Picasso's closest relationships with women, including the extramarital affair 45-year-old Picasso began with 17-year-old Marie Therese Voltaire in 1927. And I have to apologize for Nancy for my French pronunciations. I'm sorry. It's a misogyny Gadsby encapsulates by loosely quoting a statement Picasso once made. Quote, each time I leave a woman, I should burn her. Destroy the woman, you destroy the past she represents. As point of fact, the sentences, as Francoise, as Francoise Zillow reports them in her memoir, Life with Picasso, are even more chilling. This is the actual quote. Every time I change wives, I should burn the last one. That way, I'd be rid of them. They wouldn't be around to complicate my existence. Maybe that would bring back my youth, too. You kill the woman, and you wipe out the past she represents. While we might be inclined to brush off these words as merely the dramatic expression of Picasso's egotism, the stories of the major women who came into his life including Gilo, as well as the recollection of his children and grandchildren, suggests they were, they were words he did in fact live by. The trail of tragedies include Jacqueline Roque, his first wife who kills herself, Marie-Thérèse Voltaire, a jettisoned lover who kills herself, and at least two other wives, lovers, driven to mental breakdown. To read about these women today is in itself a lesson in stories and their relationships to systems of power and male dominance. As art historians and popular journalists have told it, these, are women, these women are valued as muses for their beauty, for the complex emotions they inspired in Picasso, and ultimately for their willingness to sacrifice themselves at the altar of male artistic genius. A piece in the Telegraph in 2009 covering a National Gallery exhibition of Picasso's work in London presents itself as being about the painter's, quote, complicated relationship with women, before casually noting that, quote, no one used and abused his women quite like the greatest artist of the 20th century. In a gesture characteristic of such mainstream coverage of Picasso and exhibits of his work, the Telegraph piece catalogs how the women in his life were each, quote, a crucial catalyst in his development as an artist, each standing for a different period in his career. Again and again, Picasso's muses are women who, quote, came too close to the sun, like Icarus, burning themselves upon his genius. As another Telegraph writer put it in June 2016, Less dwelled upon in news features like this is the fact that many of the women in Picasso's life were themselves artists. One anomaly, in, one anomaly in the litany of women Picasso jettisoned and destroyed is the person Picasso called, quote, the woman who says no. Francoise Gillot, who is singled out in the histories and in contemporary news stories as the only woman to have left Picasso of her own volition and to have, and to have emerged from a relationship with him unscathed. But to see Gillot as unscathed is to erase the price she paid for being the woman who said no to Picasso, who left him. A painter herself, she notes in her memoir that galleries and art dealers terminated contracts with her for fear of falling out of Picasso's favor. And to punish Gillot for publishing the memoir 10 years after their separation, Picasso attempted to sabotage her career, threatening to withdraw his work from galleries that showed interest in her work. And here I want to bring us back to Hannah Gadsby's project in Nanette, in perfect synchronicity with the arguments that would unfold in the months following the exposure of Harvey Weinstein in October 2017, Gadsby takes on the mantra that has been weaponized in debates about the call-out culture represented in the Me Too hashtag, namely the mantra that we must separate the man from the art. The art is important, not the artist. I say weaponized here because as Gadsby makes clear, the obsession with the reputation of the man is a tactic, a tactic used again and again to protect, to protect and preserve men's grip on the production of culture. 
In one of the most satisfying moments of her routine, Gadsby indicts the role comedians have played in undercutting the seriousness of accusations of abuse and reproducing a culture that protects men's power. Delivered with unembarrassed anger, she explodes. Donald Trump, Pablo Picasso, Harvey Weinstein, Bill Cosby, Woody Allen, Roman Polanski, these men are not exceptions, they are the rule. And they are not individuals, they are our stories. And the moral of our story is, we don't give a shit, we don't give a fuck about women or children, we only care about a man's reputation. What about his humanity? These men control our stories, and yet they have a diminishing connection to their own humanity, and we don't seem to mind. <clears throat> In her rather famous essay from 1929, Virginia Woolf imagines that William Shakespeare had a sister, one as extraordinarily gifted as he was, but without the same opportunity for education and adventure that would have allowed her gifts to materialize. Nevertheless, Judith, the name Woof gives to, her, to uh, Shakespeare's fictional sister, is driven by, quote, the force of her own gift alone and sets out for London to make it in the theater world. She was not 17, Woof writes. She had the quickest fancy, a gift like her brother's for the tune of words. Like him, she had a taste for the theater. She stood at the stage door. She wanted to act, she said. Men laughed in her face. The manager guffawed. He bellowed something about poodles dancing and women acting. No woman, he said, could possibly be an actress. He hinted, you can imagine what? She could get no training in her craft. Could she even seek her dinner in a tavern or roam the streets at midnight? Thwarted and eventually finding herself pregnant by the theater manager who had taken pity on her, Judith kills herself. And this, Woof argues, would have been the fate for any woman of Shakespeare's time who dared try to use her gifts for, quote, no girl could have walked to London and stood at a stage door and forced her way into the presence of actor managers without doing herself a violence. While Woof was writing in 1929 and trying to assess the world of cultural production in the late 16th century, she seems as much a writer who has seen into the future as she does one looking back. Indeed, thanks to the hashtag MeToo, we no longer have to imagine just what the theater manager hinted at when Judas Shakespeare arrived at the door looking for acting opportunities. Since the Harvey Weinstein revelations, a reckoning across the full range of institutions has been happening, and as with Picasso's women, some days it seems as if few men have been left unscathed. We have a picture that is clear by the day of how powerful men have controlled women's access to cultural production, whether through explicit demands of sex in exchange for access and opportunity, or through harassing and inappropriate behavior that no one would want to endure. We have a picture, clearer by the day, of how powerful men can block women's access to cultural production entirely should women fail to comply with their demands. And we have a picture, clearer by the day, of how institutions collude to protect that power. Pick your industry or institution, and I can tell you a story. Take, for example, the cases of talent agents like Tyler Grasham and Vincent Ciarancioni, comedians like Bill Cosby and Louis C.K., news personalities like Charlie Rose and Matt Lauer, music industry megastars and record producers like R. Kelly and Russell Simmons, concert masters and symphony conductors like Jonathan Carney and William Purcell, literary authors like Sherman Alexie and Juna Diaz, film and TV producers and, executive, and, and executives like Harvey Weinstein and Les Moonves, film directors like James Toback and Paul Haggis. A survey conducted by the Writers Guild of America West found that 64% of women writers in the Los Angeles-based guild have experienced sexual harassment in the course of their careers as writers, often in the writer's room itself. 
These examples are only the tip of the iceberg, for submerged beneath these very prominent examples are cases that never come to national attention because they appear to impact only lo local cultural scenes. Drill down, I dare you, in your Google searches, say by using the terms Chicago music scene and hashtag me too, and you can glimpse the depth of the problem. And that problem isn't only one of hostile environments and trauma, it's also a problem of lost stories and perspectives. Tarana Burke has expressed her fear that the size and very public nature of the Me Too social movement will actually work to overshadow or even undermine the original intent of her Me Too campaign, which was to empower through empathy and to direct resources to those most vulnerable, specifically girls and women of color. While no one wants to redirect effort from those causes, of course, what I hope to show tonight is that it's not wrong to focus attention on the sites of cultural production, on the very institutions that are the vehicles for our stories and that decide which stories get to be told and heard. It's attention long overdue. In the afterword to the 1993 edition of The Bluest Eye, Toni Morrison explains, quote, with very few exceptions, initial publication of The Bluest Eye was like Pecola's life, dismissed, trivialized, misread. Morrison's use of a passive verb structure here is telling. Who is doing the dismissing, the trivializing, the misreading? Who is the agent of these actions? The answer is not a simple one, but certainly we will not find it if we aren't interrogating not simply individuals, but institutions too. To be muffled, marginalized, and willfully misunderstood is the fate of too many stories shared by women, whether in the form of literary bestsellers or public testimonies on social media platforms. This is to say nothing of the stories that never get spoken, written, created, or shared because voices have been silenced, talent has been thwarted, and access has been denied. You destroy the woman, you destroy the past she represents, says Picasso. Hannah Gadsby replies, <clears throat> Maybe. I will not allow my story, excuse me, I will not allow my story to be destroyed. What I would have done to have heard a story like mine, not for blame, not for reputation, not for money, not for power, but to feel less alone, to feel connected. I want my story heard because it, ironically, I believe Picasso was right in this respect. I believe we could paint a better world if we learned how to see it from all perspectives, as many per perspectives as we possibly could, because diversity is strength, difference is a teacher, fear difference and you learn nothing, hindsight is a gift, can you stop wasting my time? Thank you.